India is a dominant player in semiconductor design, hosting several major semiconductor companies that engage in cutting-edge chip design. However, despite its prowess in design, the actual fabrication of these chips takes place overseas in countries like the United States, China, South Korea, or Taiwan. This raises the fundamental question of why India does not manufacture its own chips after designing them. In the 1980s, India embarked on a journey to establish its semiconductor manufacturing national champion, following the examples of China, Taiwan, Malaysia, Korea, and Singapore. Initially, the venture showed great promise, but it encountered a catastrophic setback, which subsequently hampered the entire semiconductor manufacturing industry in India. Many semiconductor industries in East Asia can trace their origins back to Western electronics companies relocating their outsourced factories to the region in the 1960s. For instance, in the mid-1960s, Fairchild Semiconductor considered establishing a factory in India, but the complex bureaucracy in India deterred them. Eventually, they chose Malaysia and the Philippines instead. Recognizing the accelerating pace of technological advancements in the 1970s and 80s, the Indian government identified microprocessors and other semiconductor technologies as the potential pillars of a new technological revolution. They decided to establish their presence in this domain, leading to the founding of a 100% state-owned enterprise, the Integrated Device Manufacturer, SCL, in 1984. The primary objective was to design and eventually manufacture cutting-edge circuits and electronics, with a vision of serving as the cornerstone for a native Indian electronics industry. The Indian government invested a substantial amount, ranging from 40 to 70 million US dollars at the time, into this venture. The company was headquartered in the planned city of Mohali in the state of Punjab. During that period, the economy of Punjab was primarily agrarian, but it was rapidly transitioning into an emerging electronics industry hub. Significant enterprises like Punjab Wireless Systems and Punjab Communications Limited were established in the region, contributing to its growth as a center for the electronics industry. To bolster its workforce, SEL recruited young graduates from prestigious technical institutions such as the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. These institutions had strong ties with the West and had nurtured a highly skilled pool of engineering talent. Specifically, the electrical engineering course at IIT Bombay was renowned for its excellence. SEL also tapped into the expertise of esteemed Indian electronics companies like Bharat Electronics Limited, a state-owned aerospace and defense electronics company. Creating a successful semiconductor factory hinges on four critical factors – financial capital, human capital, government support, and infrastructure, including manufacturing technology. Financial resources are essential to procure expensive chip manufacturing and testing equipment, which requires constant upgrades and maintenance. In India's case, these equipment components had to be imported, involving intricate import processes and duties. Skilled labor is crucial to operate the complex machinery effectively. Additionally, having PhD researchers engage in R&D is vital for discovering new processes and advancing the company. India excelled in this aspect. For a semiconductor facility to thrive, it requires unwavering support from the government, along with stable power and water supply. Environmental concerns are also significant, given the toxic nature of the manufacturing process. India faced challenges in these areas. Infrastructure stability is paramount. A single power outage or water shortage could disrupt months of painstaking work. Furthermore, to catch up with the industry, acquiring older process node technology is essential. Instead of reinventing the wheel, companies often enter technology transfer agreements with more advanced counterparts to learn from their expertise. However, leading semiconductor companies guard their cutting-edge technology closely, making technology transfer agreements typically applicable only to older processes. When SEL was established in 1984, it managed to license a 5-micron process technology from American Microsystems Incorporated, making a modest beginning in its semiconductor endeavors. Shortly thereafter, SEL successfully acquired process technology from two other companies as part of agreements to manufacture electronic components for them. The first deal involved a collaboration with the American industrial automation company Rockwell aimed at producing their 2560G microprocessor. The second agreement was with the Japanese firm Hitachi, focused on manufacturing components for their electronic wristwatches. Additionally, SEL performed third-party assembly services for electronics brands. Notably, they assembled the BBC microcomputer for the Indian government's computer literacy and school studies program. 
These technology transfer agreements allowed SEL personnel to receive in-person training in the United States and Japan, which they promptly shared within the company. These efforts were complemented by academic partnerships with the universities. Leveraging these resources, SEL made rapid progress, advancing from the 5 micron process technology to a 0.8 micron process by the late 1980s. Achieving 0.8 microns, or 800 nanometers, was a milestone reached in 1987 by leading companies like NTT, Toshiba, and Intel. At this point, SEL was just one semiconductor generation behind the leading edge, raising hopes that India could become a global semiconductor manufacturer within a decade. However, in 1989, a devastating fire engulfed SEL, the cause of which remains unknown. Regardless of the cause, the fire dealt a severe blow to India's semiconductor manufacturing efforts. Semiconductor fires are particularly damaging because the burning chemicals release toxic and corrosive gases, and the firefighting systems further exacerbate the damage. It took until 1997, eight years and substantial financial investment exceeding $50 million for production to resume. During this time, new entrants like TSMC, founded in 1987, and Samsung had entered the semiconductor manufacturing race and rapidly pulled ahead, securing critical global market share and scale. India lost considerable progress and the government attempted multiple proposals to compensate for the lost ground. Initially, they sought to sell the fab, but potential private investors couldn't reach an agreement with the Indian government on terms. Subsequently, the fab's focus shifted from manufacturing chips for telephone exchanges to smart cards, but this endeavor did not gain much traction either. In 2005, SEL underwent a significant restructuring, becoming an R&D center within the Department of Space. As part of this transition, SEL was renamed the Mean Semiconductor Lab. This effectively marked the end of SEL's prospects as a competitive commercial entity, and the company had long been out of the race. A substantial portion of its revenue came from government contracts, and its offerings were not competitive, neither in the domestic Indian market nor abroad. Despite having the government as a captive customer, the company struggled to turn a profit, primarily due to a lack of economies of scale. In the financial period 2005 to 2006, the company produced 1,006 inch wafers but had 20 times the installed capacity. In the 1999 2000 period, SEL generated $14 million in revenue and just $400,000 in profit. However, in its final year as a company, 2005 to 2006, SEL generated $3.5 million in revenue but incurred a $2 million loss. The year before its restructuring, the company experienced a staggering $5.6 million US dollar loss. The restructuring was seen as a merciful step to end the company's financial struggle. Today, Mean Semiconductor Lab primarily focuses on research and development work with its old 6-inch wafer fabrication facility. In 2019, they announced their ability to accept chip designs at the 180 nanometer node. Although this is far from the leading edge, there are still numerous commercial applications for semiconductor fabrication at higher nodes. The more pressing concern is the slow pace of development, as it took nearly a decade for SEL to reach the 180 nanometer node, starting at least in 2011 when they invested millions in Israel's Tower Jazz Semiconductor for a fabrication unit. Back in the early 1980s, SEL had a relative advantage as the rest of the world wasn't significantly ahead in semiconductor manufacturing. Taiwan and China had yet to enter the semiconductor industry and the equipment costs were lower. However, even before the 1989 fire, SEL was grappling with the financial strain of competing in the semiconductor business. The costs of advancing to 800 nanometers had forced them to abandon the BBC Acorn computer project. Talented SEL personnel were continuously departing for better job opportunities in the private sector or abroad. The colossal capital required for building competitive and productive semiconductor fabs has been identified as the most significant obstacle to establishing a viable semiconductor manufacturing industry in India. Leading-edge chip factories today routinely cost tens of billions of dollars, with this trend escalating, especially beyond the 14 nanometer node generation. Even for major private Indian corporations like Tata and Reliance, such investments are a substantial challenge to undertake. For instance, Reliance Geo initially spent $15 billion on their nationwide LTE data network over four years, while TSMC is investing $20 billion in a single gigafab over two years, with multiple facilities under construction.
The substantial development in such ventures needs to yield profitable returns, which is not always guaranteed in the ever-changing electronics industry landscape. Despite these challenges, the Indian government has made multiple attempts to rejuvenate the country's semiconductor manufacturing efforts, all of which have been unsuccessful. For instance, in 2006, India announced a significant project called Fab City with a budget of $3 billion aimed at semiconductor manufacturing. AMD had shown interest in establishing an assembly and test facility there until unfavorable industry conditions led to its withdrawal. In 2013, the Indian government lifted customs duties on all imports of parts and machinery related to semiconductor manufacturing. However, this move did not seem to spur any significant foundry efforts. In 2014, India approved proposals from two investor groups to build fabs in the country, with both projects collectively costing about $10 billion. The government had pledged substantial financial support, covering 25% of the total cost, along with the interest-free loans, tax breaks, and subsidies. Since then, no substantial Indian proposal has emerged, even amidst current market conditions. It is crucial to reiterate that India possesses world-class chip design capabilities. Tens of thousands of Indian engineers work directly in very large-scale integration design, and their chips are fabricated in leading-edge fabs worldwide. The separation of chip design and manufacturing, along with the complexity and costs involved in both processes, has become a global trend, making it unnecessary for companies to perform both functions simultaneously. India's strengths in chip design should be recognized, and it presents an exciting topic for future exploration. However, SEL's failure to establish itself as a successful commercial entity has had long-term consequences. Today, India has limited semiconductor fabrication capacity, and almost all of its chips, including logic and memory chips, must be imported. In 2019, India imported $21 billion worth of semiconductors, a figure that continues to grow at approximately 15% annually. The 2020 worldwide semiconductor shortage further affected critical Indian industries, such as smartphone manufacturing, disrupting a variety of businesses. Furthermore, a significant portion of these imports, 37% in 2019 or $7 billion, originated from China, raising significant geopolitical concerns given the strained Sino-Indian relations.